I think leadership can be developed. I think leadership can be modeled. And I think we need to do a better job as a society of inspiring and encouraging all of us to be leaders mm -hmm. in our own way. Patrick, sincere thanks, man. Yes, sir. Appreciate for you, uh, you know, taking the time, driving up here, and so I sincerely, to. Uh, sincerely appreciate it. If you would mind, would you go through just a little bit of background, what you do, you know, what makes up your day, kind of your current occupation, just a little bit of sort of that sort of thing for us to get us rolling? Certainly. So I'm a high school history teacher. I teach all levels of history. I teach advanced placement. I teach American History One, American History Two. And I teach it to students who are low-level learners as well as exceptional students, far brighter than I am. I also coach high school football, and I've been in this occupation 15 years. Um, I love it. I'm excited to wake up and go to work every day. Wow. Absolutely passionate about it. Love the kids, love the relationships. I teach in a small community. It's about 12,000 people in our community. We've got 1,258 students enrolled in our high school, and um, it's, it's a sense of family. It really is. And that's got its pros and its cons, but it's home more so than a job. So it sounds like uh, you were called and answered the call. I'm sure you had other right. options, other things you could have done. Right. We all know what they pay teachers, right. you know. So <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. Well, honestly, so the way I stumbled into it is I was really inspired by my high school football coach. Okay. I grew up here in North Carolina, and he had such an impact on me, and. Um, individually and collectively on our whole team. Our team actually won a state championship my senior year in high school, so we had a lot of success, we had a lot of camaraderie. It was a great time to be in high school. I wanted to replicate that with my life. I wanted to do whatever I could, not necessarily to cling to that, but to allow others to have that same opportunity. I knew I wanted to coach football. Loved the sport, loved what it meant from one side to the other. But I wasn't positive, what could I do with my life that would allow me to do that as my job? So I said, let's give teaching a shot. So when I matriculated at Elon University, I enrolled in some teacher ed classes and honestly fell in love with it. Hmm. Um, history was something that I stumbled into. Uh, it's about people, it's about their stories, it's about their lives and how we can study them and apply it to our current situation to make it as good as it can be. So that's how I came to be a history teacher. So coming out of high school, you were... I knew. This is where I'm going, this is what I'm doing. And, and Right, we, we, and I hoped it worked out. Yeah. And yeah. really didn't have a plan otherwise. <laughs> if, I mean, you know, if it didn't, then we'll back up and punt and do what yeah. we need to do. Figure something different That's out. right. Now, I was gonna ask you, you know, like, when was the first time in your life you really recognized leadership? Like, okay, this is... Right. This is what's going on. Was it your high school football coach I, or before I would, that? I, I would say it was the high school football coach. I was 14 years old and I was actually late for the very first team meeting we had in June going into my freshman year. So technically I'm not even in the high school yet. Yeah. I'm five minutes late for the 530 meeting because I had a dentist appointment. I arrived to the meeting. They had already started. I walk in and he says, you need to sit outside. We've already started. So I'm sitting there outside of the classroom wondering, oh my gosh, what does this mean? For an hour, thinking. And afterward, he gives me a little lecture on being on time. I do some punishment runs when we start practice and we go out to the field and I'm a part of the team. That sense of accountability, that sense of what he was doing and what they were doing in that room was very important and needed me to be there, impacted me. Okay. And. Uh, holding me accountable, not hesitating one minute to, he didn't, he didn't care if he hurt my feelings. It was his program and this is the way that it was going to be. And, and punctuality was important. Honestly, as I've done some thinking, that was the first moment in true leadership that I, I noticed. And the impact it had on you, you did something, wasn't even intentional. That's right. Had no idea that you were impacting him or the team or yes, whatever sir. else was going on. And all of a sudden, intervention, and then it's like, this is somebody I take seriously. Yes, sir. I wasn't even aware of these other things. I'm assuming that never happened again. You know, you played never, for four Never, <laughs> never has. <laughs> played four years, yeah. Now, do you administer that same sort of thing today with your players in your classroom? How is that, is, is it different? I do. I, well, we call it setting the tone. Okay. And they always tell young teachers, you've got to set the tone. You have to have a groundwork, a, a framework of rules. You've got to adhere to those policies and rules and regulations as strictly as possible. 
especially until you get to know the individuals. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a system in place, then you have nothing in place. And that means people are gonna push you this way and push you that way. And so what are the core values of whatever, of your classroom, what are the core values of your team? One of the core values of my head coach's team was punctuality and accountability. And I learned that immediately. So for my students, my players, initially, day one, day two, if they make the same mistake, then they get the same result. However, as time goes on, you begin to understand the people that you're working with. And sometimes there's those extenuating circumstances and they need a little more understanding. But initially, you've, you, you've got to protect the integrity of what it is you're representing. Mm -hmm. I, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I would suggest, and I'm thinking about the whole idea of you showed up five minutes late and you had to do all these extra things. I always thought Lou Holtz made a career out of going to a bowl game, being a huge underdog, and just waiting for somebody to be 30 seconds late to a team breakfast, star player. Yes. And that player was benched. Yes, sir. Invariably, what happened in his career, somebody you never heard of stepped into that position. The whole thing was elevated. He yes, used sir. to take those kinds of sets of circumstances it almost got to the point where you, th you thought he was almost trying to orchestrate them. Maybe, But he would take yeah. those kind of circumstances and he would just say, this is a great way to get everybody that's right. okay to elevate because nobody right. gives us a chance. And, and I, I would think a lot of coaches, that's, that's right. what you want, right? You that's want everybody right. to think, hey, we got no chance here. The minute the other team thinks, you know, this is just sort of a... That's an edge. That's when you have an edge. That's an edge. It sounds like you've studied Lou Holtz a heck of a lot more than I have. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> His book, The Game Plan for Success, is, is phenomenal. And, and I, I'm fortunate enough in the, our small community to go and speak to different groups, whether it's elementary schools, middle schools, um, at events at our own school, and obviously in my classroom every day. I, I need to bring in as much wisdom as I can. Mm -hmm. I need to learn as much as I can from those people who have been there and have studied leadership and have studied success and what it takes to be successful. So I do. I read these books. Um, I admire Mike Krzyzewski and what he's been able to do at Duke University. Um, don't always agree with the way he coaches or some of the styles that he chooses to use, but I really believe in his mind what he's doing is exactly what his players need at that time. Yeah. I think he's, a, he's just masterful at that. And he writes about how he treats different players different ways based upon what their needs are. I try to do the same thing. As the kids get older, you know, um, once again, I'm dealing with kids typically under the age of 18. so. Uh, Krzyzewski's one, Lou Holtz is one, there, there's many others, but Lou Holtz was phenomenal at, like you say, creating situations. He says something about momentum, and he thinks that momentum is a lot of baloney, okay? I don't totally agree with that, because you can almost feel momentum sometimes, right? And if you can almost <laughs> feel it, it's not baloney. Yeah. But here's what he says. He says, if you're losing going into a halftime, it's 14 to zero, and you score with 30 seconds left, now it's 14 to seven, half times happening you're feeling pretty good about it you may be losing but you're feeling pretty good about it because you just did something special let's say the score is uh, seven to seven and the opponent scores just before halftime what's the score 14 to seven yeah so why in one scenario are you all excited about it and the other one you're really kind of disheartened and down the score is the same so what's the difference the way you approach it mentally mm -hmm. that's easy to say when you're not in that ball game and you're trying to, you know, compel those 60, 70 kids to let's all do this, it's okay, because they all have their own notions. But that's where the groundwork's got to be laid early on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that made a lot of sense to me. Oh, yeah. And no, mathematically, absolutely. You, it's, can't, it's a, you can't argue with the math there. You can't argue with the math. <laughs> that's one thing we're sure. It's interesting. There's example after example made of coaches, the teachers, you know, that were very successful in eras gone by mm -hmm. that just flat out couldn't make it today. Like Vince Lombardi could not coach today. Right, right. You know, Bobby Knight would have a heck struggle. of a tough time, you know, Bear Bryant. That's right. Do you run up against sort of uh, cultural, generational challenges, pushback? Hey, wait a minute, you know? Like, I do. I, I think too, as a society, obviously we're different. And so coaching has to be different. We have evolved as a society and we will continue to evolve. It's never ending. So several years ago, I did a study on love languages. What are people's love languages? And there's five of them, and we don't have to go into details about what those five are, but how is it that people give and people receive love? In order to coach, you've got to understand how people receive love, because if you're going to show them love, 
and if you're going to develop them and earn their trust, you've got to know what language they speak. Some people do it through gifts. Some people do it through words of kindness. Some people do it through uh, physical affection, different types of love. So a high five to one kid may mean more than 100 words. For other kids, it may mean a positive note or encouragement in their locker or on their desk when they come into the classroom. And that's the way that you coach them. Yeah. That's the way that you get them to trust you so that you can take them to the places that they need to go. You can do it and do it comfortably. So that, lack of a better term, diagnostic process, what are you reading in those kids? And, and I'm sure there's not one thing, but right. just maybe give me one example. Like, what are you reading from somebody that leads you to believe, uh, I can do this, but I gotta shy away from this to establish what I want right. to establish? I think body language and simply observing them coming down the hall, observing them before practice starts and the whistle blows with their peers, watching how they interact with one another tells you a lot about who they are. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to talk to them. And then once you do begin to discuss and to have dialogue with them, you fish a little bit. You see what makes them click. You throw some things out there and see how they respond to it. You ask certain questions and they're not preconceived questions. You just go with the flow of the conversation and get a feel for who they are as an individual. And then you've got to tap into that as their leader, as their coach. Okay, okay. So personalized, That's right. making mental notes, maybe even a couple of physical notes, but there's like exactly. this investigative process That's right. that, you're, That's you right. know, that you're going through. And, I'll, and I'll add too, sorry to interrupt. I'll no, add no too, problem. You've got to be careful not to pigeonhole them into one particular area because the first or the second impression you have could change. Remember, I'm dealing with adolescents and, and teenagers and young adults. So as they change and their needs change and their hormones change, they change. As they learn more in school, as they learn more about you, as they learn more as a football player, their needs change. Mm -hmm. And it's critical that we're constantly evaluating them in a very formative way. Objective. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Trying to seek that. Yeah. What is the most frustrating thing about leading? You know, there's overwhelming positives and, and just a real sort of like a self-actualization that you get from doing what you do and, right. you know, thank you for that. Right. But what are the, what are the frustrations? What, what, what are some of the things associated with, oh boy, this is, I wish this thing would just go away. Yeah. Well, I, so we'll look at it in a couple of different ways. So yeah. for me, I'm not only leading students, I'm also leading coaches. And in leading coaches, one of the most frustrating things is I don't have the hiring or the firing power that a college coach would have or that a principal at a school would have. And sometimes, to be honest with you, we get stuck with coaches that aren't on the same page as us. Mm -hmm. That's very frustrating. They're not willing to make the sacrifice. They're not willing to put in the work. They maybe aren't willing to be focused. They haven't matured themselves as an individual. And so they find too much common ground with the kids and they enjoy being there instead of finding common ground and developing relationships, but also being the leader that they need to be at their very own position. You know, football is very much compartmentalized and we have these different positions, but we all have to be on the same page with the same end focus. And it, it's been a challenge for me to learn how to manage those coaches who aren't as invested as what I wish they would be. So they're, they're coaching for obviously different reasons than you were coaching for. Right. So where, where would they come from? Just, right. just for my own edification. So if you're not hiring them or saying, hey, listen, you've got some well, potential I want you to join, they're uh, forced on you somehow. So we haven't had a lot of staff turnover. But to be honest with you, so sometimes people don't end up being what they appear to be in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you make a poor choice in the hiring process. Right. Well, the way teaching is and the way the profession is, it's difficult. So they may be a great teacher in this particular subject and you thought they were gonna be a great coach. It just doesn't work out. Yeah. So you really have to do the best you can as a leader to make up for that deficiency. Mm -hmm. And what's wild is sometimes their very own players will make up for that deficiency because the player is more mature and the player gets more learning and more understanding than what that coach even does. And you hope that the coach will come around. So there's all types of professional development. You can have casual conversations and those will make things better. But remember, if they're not motivated in the beginning, will those things motivate them? And sometimes they mature and we'll see what happens. They mm -hmm. redirect their focus. With players, the most challenging thing is 
having them become great at time management. We require a lot out of our players, and, and I require as a teacher a lot out of my students. Time management is so very important, but I can't just tell them manage your time. I have to constantly remind them. So at the end of every practice, I'm telling them, the nine weeks, which is the end of our grading period, the nine weeks is ending in five weeks. Okay, we're almost halfway through. Make sure you're getting your work turned in. Make sure that we're far enough in now that if you need tutoring, you're getting it. Make sure these things, and then I'll follow up with that. So while I'm talking to the kids, I know who is struggling and who's not, and I'll make purposeful eye contact before I even have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So just helping them manage their time for academics, manage their time for athletics, manage their time for their social lives, or whatever it is that is going on. The older kids, a lot of them work. We had a young man, we had some 6 a.m. practices this past summer, try to beat the heat. He said he was gonna be late for practice. Why are you gonna be late? Start at 6 a.m., I mean, what could you be doing? I'm working third shift, unloading trucks at McDonald's. I don't get off till seven. Let's see if we can speak with your manager. Maybe you can go in an hour early, get off an hour early and just be a little bit late for practice. He's managing his time. Mm -hmm. He's got a real life situation he's dealing with and he's not working third shifts because he's excited about it. He's working third shifts <laughs> because, didn't volunteer for because that he one. has to. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But he also wants to play football and right. he also wants to maintain his 3.0 GPA. How can I help him do that? And mm -hmm. that's, that's challenging at, all, at times Yeah. because I got my own issues, right? My own time management things that I'm struggling with. Oh. But back to the service leadership, if I care, I'll make the sacrifices to do what I can to help him. Oh yeah. How do you, as a coach, as a parent, as a teacher, handle success, hmm. treat it philosophically, and flip side of that coin, how do you handle failure? Yeah. The inevitable outcomes that uh, accompany any sort of a mission. So it's been a character flaw, to be honest, that I've become aware of over the last few years. Honestly, I handle success and I handle failure really the same way. What could I have done to be better? The problem is sometimes you don't stop and smell the roses and enjoy the victories along the way. As a head junior varsity coach, I've won 90% of the games that we've played in since 2005. As the varsity defensive coordinator, we've won 88% of the games we've been involved in since 2005. And that's really when I got started, which is why I date it back to that time. So we've had a lot of success. And it's not that you take them for granted, but it's that you're always looking to improve. How many missed tackles did we have? How many points did we give up? How many yards did we surrender? How many kids did I not have perform well on the state test? How many kids didn't get college credit for that AP exam? How many kids didn't graduate? Not necessarily how many kids did, how many kids didn't. Even if it's 100%, which is, I mean, it's never 100%. There's mm -hmm. always going to be room for improvement. And with a careful eye, I'm looking for that. However, I've learned that it's okay. Nick Saban uses it, he calls it the 24 hour rule. Mm -hmm. Take 24 hours and enjoy it or cry about it. Yeah. And after that, let's move on. Go. And yeah. I, I have tried to apply that to my own situation. Yeah. But it's yeah. tough because if you take 24 hours, you're going to look back and say, man, that's some time I could have used. Yeah, I could have figured that out. I could have done Especially when you're week to week, like with a game plan or whatever. When yeah. it's big picture, whole program stuff, 24 hours isn't so much. So yeah. there's that, and I don't know if that's a great answer or not, but success and failure I handle the same way, personal reflection. Yeah. How do you manage superstars? How do you lead superstars? People that are mm -hmm. really gifted, and, mm -hmm. and I suppose I would think more of that athletically than I might somebody that you would see in a history class or whatever, sure. but, but we're, we're- No, there's that too. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, how do you handle, influence, lead kids that have special talent? Is yeah. it more of a challenge, less of a challenge? Well, it's the three rules. Do the right thing, make the most of what you've got, and, and love and respect others. And, and trying to just reiterate to them that this is who you need to become. You need to do the right thing. Just because you have this talent or this success doesn't give you a get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. You need to make the most of it. So in the last couple of years, we've actually been fortunate enough to coach some All-State players and some All-Americans, which is an amazing thing. We've had every college imaginable coming through the, the halls of our school wanting to give these boys scholarships to play college football. Alabama, uh, Stanford. Uh, Greg Schiano and I talked for an hour two years ago. He was down from Ohio State. He had just taken the job as the defensive coordinator. 
and, um, and his name's in the hat for a lot of jobs right now. So these guys are coming in, and, and these kids get the big head. Mm -hmm. And they all put on Twitter, I'm pleased to announce I got my 21st offer, I'm blessed to announce I got my seventh, whatever it is. Yeah. You gotta reel that in. You gotta reel that in. And it's like, why are you doing this? What is motivating you right now? What did you want when you came in as a freshman? Why are you acting this way right now? Now you gotta be honest with them. And their parents need to be a part of that conversation because parents get caught up in that as well. Parents really get more caught up in it than players do. Oh yeah. For whatever reason, whether it's vicarious living, whether it's just they're super proud and every time they get an offer, they become more and more and more proud. You gotta, you gotta keep them focused on what's right there in the center because if not, you'll create dissension within your team. So a coach shows up, you and I are sitting beside each other in class and he wants to speak to you and not me. I'm really good too. Why didn't he want to speak to me? Now all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm naturally jealous of you. That's not good. And so we don't shy away from it. We talk about it and we put it out there. Classroom's a little different. Yeah. It's different because in a classroom, what you do and what I do does not make a difference on how I score and how you score. Right. Football's very different. We need each other. We have to have each other. There's no way around it, period. Classroom's different. So I'm still working on the classroom part. I don't have any great answers for that. Sometimes I've had some Ivy League kids come along and they're arrogant, they're conceited. That is who they are. And no matter how hard I try to humble them at times, they're not gonna be humbled. So we find other things that they're not necessarily good at, do some of those activities in class, and that encourages the other kids, whereas maybe it humbles them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's gonna be great at everything. So if they're super great at articulating during a speech in class, or they're really great at essay writing, let's do something that requires some artistic ability that maybe they're not quite as good at, but this kid over here who's not as good or not as articulate at giving a speech, they can have some success. So differentiated learning helps create more of an equal playing field. And plus, you're meeting the learning needs of all those different students. Yeah, and, and I would say, like, like I say, especially with really talented um, you know, kids or employees or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever else it is, that there is an aspect to um, providing circumstances that teach humility. Yes. That sort of really, in many cases, can get them to embrace their talent that much more. That's right. And drag some others with them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. do a lot of that in football. Purposeful adversity. Right in the middle of practice, we'll stop and create a situation where these kids have to respond. Maybe we flip the script and we do conditioning at the start of practice instead of the end. So we just run them and run them and run them and run them. And then we'll go into a team period where they have to perform. Now play, yeah. And they're exhausted and they're tired and it's 90 degrees outside. And borderline not able to do what it is we're asking them to do. And that's a different thing too. We gotta keep a beat on how they're feeling and how their health is, but pushing them to where when they are in that situation, they're gonna be able to, uh, to excel. Yeah, leadership. If you were asked to define it, given the realm that you influence people mm -hmm. in, how would you define it? Uh, certainly not an expert on leadership, but a, a book that really inspired me and a term that I'll, I'll steal from that was Tony Dungy's book on mentor leadership mm -hmm. and, and really with a focus on service leadership. Um, servant leadership is where we rest as high school teachers and coaches. We are providing a service to our students and to our players. Mm -hmm. We are selling them a product, a product that they've got to have. And we're not only selling them a product, we're selling their parents a product. And their parents are entrusting us to give the very best product that we possibly can to their child, whether it's an education, whether it is character development on the football field, whatever it is, we're giving them a product. And we are serving their needs, whatever those needs are at that time. I never know what my day is gonna hold. I never know what a kid's gonna need. A kid may need lunch money. A kid may need a ride home after practice. And there's certain protocols and procedures in the modern era we have to follow with that. But there's all these things that kids need. Just yesterday, and you talk about uh, leadership in a school, just yesterday I'm having a conversation with our athletic director and one of our assistant principals walks by and, and he's, he's got a doctorate. He's holding a roll of toilet paper. I call him in the room, I say, hey doc, what are you carrying toilet paper for? He said, well, we've got a basketball game tonight and the bathroom down here is out, so I'm replacing it. Hmm. This guy's got a PhD in education from UVA and he's replacing toilet paper in the bathroom and smiling about it. Yeah. That's the service leadership we're looking for. And that's the kind of guys that, that we like to surround ourselves with. So, yeah, service leadership. Yeah, yeah. the needs I, of our kids. I remember um, 
reading maybe the same book about Tony Dungy and, and seeing some things about him. And there's certain people, just their lives inspire you to be better. The mm -hmm. more you see them, the more you read about them. Mm -hmm. You just go, eh, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm ever going to wind up like that, but I'm going to, I'm going to shoot. For I'm going to read this and I'm going to do a couple things. But Dungy used to talk about the fact that every time, like the first day of practice, mm -hmm. you know, when he was coaching in the NFL, that he would huddle the players up and, and he'd start talking to them. And he'd say, by the way, this is as loud as I'm ever going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't scream, I don't curse, I don't do this, I don't do, you know, but, but it really was kind of that tone setting thing mm -hmm. that was very different, you know, from what you would think or That's what right. you see or the image that you see of a football coach at any level. Mm -hmm. How does servant leadership, mm -hmm. how, how does that make it more difficult on at least occasion to manage the expectations of kids, either academically or athletically? <sighs> Or does so, it? <laughs> I don't know that it does. Yeah, okay. I, because I think if in your heart you have their best interest in mind, then you're going to put your own expectations and your own self-interest to the side to meet their needs. And I find inspiration from that. When, when students come back and they thank me for the things that I've done, when I see positive praise in other places, when I see them simply go off and have success, and I know that I had a small part to do in that, I find satisfaction. So for me, it's not a challenge. Of course, it's got its moments when, when things don't go well, whether they make a poor choice and you feel like, wow, what did, what did I do to let them down? Mm -hmm. And you're reflecting upon the things that you could have done or you, you should have done maybe a little differently. The best part about this job and the worst part about this job is every year there's a new batch. You've had one for four years and you're gonna send them on, mm -hmm. but here's gonna come another. So we've got a four year window to develop these kids. And if we look at it that way and we, we take the, the pros with the cons, I don't, I don't think there is a letdown of expectations because you're not going to win them all. Yeah. You may be too positive for me because I like to just get mired down in negativity every now and then. So like I one, think we all do. One more shot here, right? But So the, the expectation thing, maybe the challenge isn't as much with the kid, but the challenge is with the parent. Okay. So the parent... Um, you know, who's a stakeholder here. Right. My kid should be starting. My kid's a Certainly. you know division one talent, you know, all of that sort of thing. You mentioned parents are one of your biggest right. stakeholders right. as well and you kind of enjoy those discussions. How do you approach that whole Yeah, that's dynamic, that's, that's you know? tough. Because they're less than objective, you know. That I is, can, yeah. yeah, that's tough. In fact, this week alone I've had three conversations about that very topic. Um, one of them didn't even pertain to an athlete at our school. A parent was calling asking for advice from another school because they knew I had to deal with it on the coach's end and what, what should they do. Mm -hmm. It's a real problem. You know, everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to be in the spotlight. Our program, we've been very fortunate. We've won at least 10 regular season games for the last 15 years. We have a successful program. One thing's for certain though, is we haven't won a state championship in that entire span of time. And I think the reason, we, you know, just a constant assessment, I think the reason is because we've got a lot of great kids who try really hard, but we always run into a buzzsaw of kids who are bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to disparaging expectations there, that's certainly, that hurts. And the last week or two of the, at the end of the season, those first week or two at the end of the off season, you know, it's all about what can we do to get better and what did we do that just didn't go our way this past year? So in dealing with the parents, the number one thing, and you talk about leadership, I was in the middle of a ball game one time and a parent wanted to speak to um, our defensive coordinator. I was an assistant defensive coach at the time, I'm 25 years old, learning a lot. And I learned a lot that night that I'll never, ever, ever forget. And the parent was disappointed and was just adamant, had to talk to the coach immediately. And that's not typical protocol, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, she was able to ha gain access to him. And she gave him an earful. And the coach said, ma'am, this is the way that it's gonna be. We love your son. If you don't like it, he doesn't have to play. You can take and leave right now. But if he stays, this is the way it's gonna be. So he put it into her court mm -hmm. and let her make the decision. Are you gonna take him or is he gonna stay? And he stayed. At the end of the year, she gave us a plaque thanking us for everything that we did to help her kid. <laughs> Seriously, he went in the military and he's had a great career there. Yeah. But learning that, we have a team and there, nobody has the right to be on the team. It's a privilege and it's an opportunity that they don't all have to be afforded. At any time, there's a situation that just can't be remedied with good 
casual conversation, it, uh, just point out. Mm -hmm. They don't have to play. If you're that upset, maybe you'd be happier somewhere else. And that's okay. Yeah. And that, that may not be the answer they want to hear. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you've got to do what's best for the team. Always an option. So with all of this, the age old question, is leadership something you learn or is leadership something you're born with? Are the people that gravitate towards positions and situations, teachers, coaches, corporate leaders, those kinds of things, is that kind of a DNA driven thing that's in them? Or is it something where y you can really study leadership like any other skill, mm -hmm. right? You can study it, you can practice it, and you can make yourself right. a leader. Which side of the philosophical? Well, leadership doesn't just have to be the president of the United States or the CEO of a company. Leadership could be the child in my class that when the person beside them didn't hear the question or didn't know what page they were supposed to turn to, and they're not asked, but they lean over and they say, this, you know, this is what he said, or this was the page, that's leadership. Mm -hmm. That young lady or that young guy facilitating and helping the instruction of this person beside him who needed a helping hand, that's leadership. So with that being said, no, I think, I think leadership can be developed. I think leadership can be modeled. And I think we need to do a better job as a society of inspiring and encouraging all of us to be leaders mm -hmm. in our own way. With that being said, we have to understand and have deference for our situation and for our position. Being a leader doesn't mean you're the boss. Mm -hmm. It just simply means that you're helping someone else. Yeah, yeah. We have a tendency to define it that way. It's like leadership is position no, power, no. But, but you're absolutely right. I mean, leadership is the kid on the team that steps up in the locker room and says, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. What are we doing? Yep. You, know, that, yep. that, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. Why aren't there more good teachers like yourself? I appreciate the compliment. You haven't seen me teach. Maybe I just <laughs> do it a good job. I'll take your word for it. Do it a good job I'll of take pretending it, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah. You know, everybody thinks about somebody like you. Those people all got us somewhere, right, right. to where we are, whatever that happens to be, you know. But why aren't there more people that say, you want to know something? This is the stuff I want to do, and I'm going to go to Elon, and I'm going to learn some stuff, and I'm going to come right. back here, and I'm going to do this, because what could be better than helping to jumpstart? Sure. You know, over the course of your coaching career thus far, your teaching and coaching career, how many kids have you had direct impact on? Several thousand. Yeah. So why aren't there more folks like yourself mm -hmm. that kind of hear that calling? Well. It's hard to answer that because it's the only calling I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And it's the only thing I've ever done. And to assess why someone chooses something else is to just take a guess. Mm -hmm. So in taking a guess, which I've thought about it, in, th in taking a guess, it, it may be offensive to others, but it's my opinion. So he here it is, here's, yeah, the, yeah. here's the truth. Yeah. I think a lot of other people are motivated by greed, by the pursuit of wealth, mm -hmm. um, instead of the pursuit of service. Well, it doesn't. I mean, money, you got to have. But if it, I don't find satisfaction in that. Uh, money's great, don't get me wrong, but it's not, it's not what gets me up in the morning at all, and it's certainly not what, what puts me to bed at night. So I, whatever, I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, some sort of fame to go along with that, the fame and fortune thing. There's so many people that want to, they think that this is how fame is, is defined. And they, they want to be famous for something. They want to work up that corporate ladder or they want to be the absolute best that they can be to own their own dealership or whatever it is. And those things are all great. That's what motivates them. What motivates me isn't greed and not that greed's a bad thing, but it's not greed. And it's certainly not fame. It's doing what I can to help those folks on the ground. And maybe it's because that's what people did to me and I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm a Christian and my faith background is about meeting the needs of others and putting others before you, you put the needs of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I do. That's kind of in there someplace? Okay. Absolutely. It, giving is better than receiving, that whole okay, thing this, that whole this, deal. This, this time of the year. Yeah. Um, I, I will say this, and, and this is very mm -hmm. important, and, and as I get older and my family begins to get older, it becomes more and more and more apparent. There's only so much of me. And I find myself, and we have these conversations as those teachers who've been around a while and are also family, leaders of families. I've got to be careful and not to sacrifice the needs of my own family to meet the needs of someone else's. Mm -hmm. And I find myself 
I'm aware of it, but I find myself doing that far too often. I'm busy responding to this parent email or corresponding with a child, but yet my own child has a question. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is that balance there. Yeah. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge that when you care so much, there's only so much you, of you to go around. Is, is there a different uh, leader you become in your household than at East Elements High School? I mean, what's different, what's, what's similar yeah. about those two settings? Well, it's funny, so, so my in wife- In one setting, you're obviously not in charge. Right, right. that's, 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 that's a given. That. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, 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 and my lovely bride reminds me all the time, we don't need Coach Stokes. <laughs> we, this isn't Coach Stokes' team. Yes, ma'am. I, I know exactly what you yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. You, just being a parent, it, it's managing, it's juggling, it's helping, it's guiding and directing, it's listening, listening to and observing where do they need me right now? How can I be their leader? Sometimes they need me to step in and advocate for them for whatever reason. Other times they need me to not step in and let them handle the situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they need uh, tough love. Sometimes they need... Uh, understanding and compassion and a hug, um, a little honey and a little vinegar. I don't know. <laughs> you just play it as you go. It's like a ball game. You don't know how it's going to play out, but you better be prepared to make the best decision possible at that moment. Otherwise, you're going to lose and, and you're going to miss out. The difference is in a ball game, it's a ball game. When it's with your own students or when it's with your own children, you might not get tomorrow to make that new impression. In the last two days, I've been super proud of the way that my children have responded to a certain situation. So my daughter, this morning in fact, is brushing her teeth. And we have one of these electric toothbrushes and everybody has their own head and then you take the head off and you put yeah. it in anyway. So she's using the electric toothbrush and I've made it clear I've got a meeting and I gotta get to work on time. I had to leave early to come here today, so it's a big day. I walk in the bathroom to brush my teeth and she's brushing her teeth with our toothbrush. I said, like, oh, all right, girl, when you finish, I need it. Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> Three minutes or so later, I walk in there. There's the toothbrush with my head on it with toothpaste on it. She's nine. I didn't ask her to. Wow. She did that for me. It was super thoughtful. Oh, yeah. That was all her. 1,000% that was her. But somewhere along the line, she either received a gift like that or found satisfaction in giving a gift like that, and she decided to do that. So that's Elizabeth. So two days ago, Jackson, Jackson's girlfriend, has a bit of a health issue and says, I'm not going to go to softball workouts. And he says, but is it that bad? Your, your team needs you to be there. Your coaches expect to see you there. What type of message does it send if you just don't go? You already missed this day last week because of this field trip. Now you're going to miss this day too because you just don't feel real well. I get that you can't practice, but at least you can be there show that you, you care. She says, well, why are you sad? He says, well, if you don't care enough about that part of your life, what other parts of your life do you not necessarily? I'm like, good gracious, Coach Stokes, you wow. kind of calm down, but he sees that. <laughs> he's 15 and he's applying the same things that he's learned from being, you know, in my family and on our football team and other things he's heard from coaches and probably teachers too, to his own relationship. And I don't know if it's going to be great and how that's going to turn out for him, but I'm at least I'm happy that in his own life, he understands the importance of commitment. Oh yeah. And doesn't want to tolerate the lack of commitment from those around him. Yeah. I, I like that. Well, it, it seems like you got all these people following you around that just somehow, some way are doing all these leadership related things. Yeah. It's possible it has something to do with you and the, you know, the role right. modeling that right. you're doing for them. So, but, right. but yeah, those are two awesome stories. It strikes me from my perspective, much more interested in yours, obviously, there's, there's some parallels between what you do and what goes on in corporate mm -hmm, worlds. Certainly. And, and there's some differences. How, how do you see that? The whole idea of like what you do and then going into an organization right. or maybe getting politically involved and kind of doing something like that. How, how do you see, what are the similarities and what are some of the differences? I think it all boils down to the fact that we're, we're human beings. And we all have these things that intrinsically motivate us. At least if we don't, we, we should. And I think if people aren't motivated intrinsically, then we gotta look somewhere else, whether it's players, whether it's personnel, whether it's staff, teachers, whatever. If they're not motivated naturally showing up, are they really invested in it? And why are they there? Mm -hmm. if, they're not, if they don't wanna be successful, then why are they there? So uh, I hate to quote coaches all the time, but this coach said, the best way to motivate your team is to get rid of those that are unmotivated. 
Mm -hmm. That's an honest approach to it. But sometimes we need a little push, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's in business or in politics or in coaching or in teaching, whatever it is, it all boils down to the same human characteristics. We're looking for love. We're looking for passion. We're looking for leadership. Even leaders are looking for leadership somewhere. Really believe that. We're looking for discipline and for strategies. I think too, we're, we're looking for a plan. What is gonna get us from point A to point B? And then once we get to point B, how about point C? What if we didn't get to point B? Well, let's regroup and let's figure out what happened. That plan, you gotta have a plan in place. I've never led anything except for a team, a classroom, and my family, right? So whether these concepts and, and practices would apply, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to find out. But I, but I think because at the end of the day, we're all humans and we all have the same needs. I don't see why there, there can't be a cross-reference there. As a history teacher, mm -hmm. Like, who are three or four people, hmm. maybe more than that, from history that you've studied, maybe in depth, that you've wow. learned something from and said, eh, can I tr see if this works or try this or sort of be, be more like right. that? Obviously, you have a lot of coach role models. Right. But who maybe that we would all be familiar with? Have you yeah. studied and said, wow, you know, right. that was pretty special? Well, and you mentioned the moment ago, maybe you're more negative than I am. When I study <laughs> historical figures. I will guarantee you I'm more negative. I don't know. <laughs> I try to, I look at the positives and the negatives. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you, you know, I don't want to just emulate my life after this guy. I mean, because there's going to be some negatives, right? Because we're human. I recently saw a Ken Burns documentary on Teddy Roosevelt. Boy, what a great guy. Oh, yeah. Full of life full of vigor and just charisma, passionate about everything he did. He had a lot of negatives too going on. But, but I mean, this guy ate a dozen eggs a day. Every day for breakfast, a dozen <laughs> eggs. I've only got the nine. I can't get quite to the dozen. No, I'm just kidding. But he, he was a cowboy and he took chances. And I admire that. I'm a guy who I haven't taken a whole lot of chances. I mean, I'll take chances here and there, but with my life, yeah. you know, he would just pack up and move. And he had the resources to do that. He had some deep pockets. Yeah. But that helped him get to where he was. But you talk about leadership. Uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. That was his whole thing on leadership. And, and then on the other side, his distant cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And this is coming from a man that America didn't know at the time is wheelchair bound. That was a victim of polio that had been through all types of heartache growing up with a father who was significantly older than his mother and dying at an early age. He went through all types of bullying when he was in, in boarding school and in college. And this guy says in the face of the greatest economic disaster this history, uh, this country will ever see, hopefully will ever see. <laughs> he, he, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And he had a plan. He had a plan. In the mm -hmm. first 100 days, he did more than any other president in the life of their administration. And every president since has been compared to that standard. That's a couple of Roosevelt's right there. Yeah. You know? And one was a Republican, one's a Democrat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, if you want to look back on earlier leaders w within history, or I'm an American history guy, as you can tell, but yeah. there's a lot of world That's leaders. That's fine, yeah, yeah. Um, Anywhere you want to go. Really admire George Washington not just as a military leader. In fact, I admire him more as a manager of people. That first cabinet had some strong personalities oh, yeah. and people who had contributed in great ways to this country. The writer of the Constitution, James Madison's on that cabinet. Thomas Jefferson, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, which is still quoted daily around the world, on that cabinet. Alexander Hamilton's on that cabinet. John Adams. How do you manage those guys? Yeah. These are the leaders of our country. When we think about our founding fathers, Perhaps there was one father and the rest were founding brothers. And maybe Washington was a brother too, right? But managing those people, what an amazing leader that guy was. Oh yeah. And I don't know how great of a job he did um, because he, he had a very short period and we had a lot of falling out and America kind of had to straighten itself out. I'm not gonna say Washington straightened us out. You know, we're still straightening ourselves out, but the entire <laughs> 19th century was really fixing and the first half of the 19th century was really fixing a lot of the problems that weren't addressed at the onset of our nation. So, boy, the way he managed Hamilton and Jefferson was pretty pretty amazing. Oh yeah. It's interesting, because I, I would have many of the same role models. Yes, sir. can I add one more? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. To that list. Yeah. Um, Betty Friedan in the 19, late 50s and, and 60s, Gloria Steinem, the things that they went on, out on a limb and did, 
whether I agree wholeheartedly with their actions or not, doesn't, doesn't matter. They had guts, they had courage, mm -hmm. and they were willing to shake up the foundation of this nation to, to do what they thought was right, mm -hmm. to do the right thing. John Lewis, John Lewis, the leader of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s, with what he did on the march from Selma to Montgomery, and what he's still doing, serving this nation, and, and shaking it at its foundation, whether I agree with it or not, takes a lot of courage and a lot of guts in a time when it was not easy, nor acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and others, as we all know, lost their life fighting for some of those very same rights. Yeah. So those, what great leaders they were. Oh yeah. You know, and they didn't just talk it, they walked it, they lived it. Um, they were people of action. Yeah, put a lot on the line. You kind of usurped my line of thought there because many of the people that I would look at through history, I would have had you know, some of those same names on the list. I'm assuming when you greet a group of new students on your team, it's a really diverse group of kids, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How has the whole notion of diversity in particular, um, you know, how does it complicate you know, what you do as a leader? Um, or, or from your experience, does it? I think it's a valuable asset. I think we gotta use it in a positive. I don't, I don't think it complicates it at all. I think okay. it adds value to it. But you gotta know how to tap into it. And you gotta know how to tap into it without being offensive. You don't wanna call somebody out and say, well, because you're different, what do you think here? No, I mean, you gotta blend <laughs> it in. But yeah. we are a diverse people. And on different levels, even though that me and, and this person may appear to be the same, we're diverse. It's just a different type of diversity. Yeah. So tapping into that diversity and getting as much input in so many different ways. What, you talk about service, you know, what best meets your needs? Here, we can do this, guys, or we can do this. Which one do we want to do today? You decide. We're going to get something effective out of both of it. Mm -hmm. You decide. Giving those kids a voice, and then through that voice, they begin to gain a little bit of character development, a little bit of maturity. They start to speak up a little bit, and now they're taking ownership. But they're doing it with their own thoughts and notions and, and backgrounds in mind. That's the angle they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how we do a really good job of tapping into that diversity, giving kids a voice and some decision-making power. Yeah, I'd ask you to respond to this because yes, I've sir. thought it for a long time and maybe I've been thinking the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. But diversity is a much bigger deal when all we're doing is defending who we are, where we come from, and how we're different. Right. If you put really diverse kids on a football team with a common goal, mm -hmm. and they literally have to work together mm -hmm. as a team to achieve, a, a lot of times diversity challenges become, because of what you do in practice, because right. of what you, you know, your expectations as a coach, those types of issues, the issues that separate us kind of fall to the wayside, That's right. and the issues of commonality bring us together just sort of, of naturally. I mean, is that a day-to-day, year-to-year experience you have, or is, is, is that just kind of wishful thinking? No, they definitely bring us together. And I think that, honestly, diversity, and, and whether it be uh, racism, sexism, we've actually got three females on our team right now. Hmm. One of the opponents that we played this year, they had a, a starting linebacker that was a female. So, so definitely sexism there. Um, but racism and sexism, all those things go out the window because like you say, we all have a common goal. We're all here for the same purpose. I haven't seen any, any at all of those negative qualities that really just bog down our society. I've never as a coach seen any of those on the team which is perhaps why in the civil rights movement of the 60s, they decided to use athletics as a way to promote and streamline integration. And it had its challenges, but it wasn't because the sport trickled into society, it was because society trickled into the sport. Mm -hmm. We live in a community that, that really, in my opinion, as a whole, values diversity. We are a bit of a bedroom community here for the Research Triangle Park, and so there's a lot of people of a lot of different backgrounds. Give you a, a little idea, so our, our community's grown a lot. In the late 1990s, we had about 4,000 people living in our city. Now, like I said in the beginning, we've got over 12,000. So that's significant growth in 20 year period. And it ain't because they had a lot of kids and decided to stay there. <laughs> people are coming, so, but they're bringing those different backgrounds with them. And if you were to poll our players and say, how many of your parents went to this same school? Less than half of the 135 kids on our program. 
So, which has its own challenges because of that sense of tradition and that understanding of who they are and where they're from and the way that we kind of do things here. You got to reteach those things. Mm -hmm. But no, we, we don't have much of a challenge with that. In the classroom, if I can elaborate there. Yeah. I do teach some low level learners, but typically I've got some really advanced kids. And the first thing that, that we're going to do is, is we're going to talk about our three rules. And I stole these three rules from Lou Holtz. I love them. <laughs> and these are actually posted on my wall when they walk in. And we, these are the three rules, you guys. Outside of this, you ask me if you got a question. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to do our very best to make the most of the opportunity that we're giving. And we are going to respect and love each other. You may not have to like them, but because we're here at the same time, at the same place, doing the same thing, we're going to love that about the person we're sitting around mm -hmm. because they're sharing the same burdens that we're sharing. And if you follow those three things, the rest of it kind of takes care of itself. Now you've got to reiterate it. And sometimes people will say some things, but honestly in my class, I've been fortunate, when some people do say some things, they, they didn't mean anything by it. it. Came out the wrong way, they repeated something that they had heard that they really didn't realize the implications. And the moment they realized that was offensive, they're apologetic and we move on. Figuring it out. Which yeah. is the way it ought to be. Yeah. I got to believe there are questions I didn't ask you that I should have. What aspect of influencing other people in whatever realm of life, what did I miss? Right. I don't know. Um, for me, and I, I did some thinking driving in. For me personally, you know, I've been in the same job, essentially doing the same thing for the last 15 years. I've turned down six head coaching positions in that span of time. Because I feel like there's work to be done where I am and you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. So I think for me, it's important to understand what impact can I make where I am and make as great of an impact as what I possibly can with the opportunities that I'm giving. I think that's very important. And it's not about a title. It's not even necessarily about a leadership position that may be more powerful, but it's about doing the best I can with what I've got in that situation. And it's not about settling, it's not about complacency, it's about evaluating your situation. Mm -hmm. And where am I most needed? And at this time in my life, this is where I'm most needed. And my family, and keeping oh, yeah. continuity and stability in my family is a big part of that. They're very involved in the community. If I didn't have that family, thank God I do, but if I didn't, probably would have taken some other opportunities. But in the meantime, instead of looking at the jobs I don't have, let me do the best job I can with the one I've got. Yep. And the rest of it will take care of itself later on. Because there's room for me to grow right here. Yeah. I heard Mr. Goldsmith say in a video I watched that the older he gets, the less aspiring he becomes, but the greater impact he has. Yeah, very true. I could 1000% agree with that. Well, and that's okay. I will tell you this, I just gotta say, if there were more people like you, there'd be less problems in the world. Well, thank you. And I mean that, and I just want to say sincere thanks. Oh, thank you. On behalf of everybody at the Center for Leadership Studies for taking time to share your thoughts. Thanks for having me.